Hello, this isn't the normal setup and it will return to what it normally is in a second. I just wanted to add a little bit of a prelude onto this video. I had hoped to get the Brian Eno guide out this week. That was my schedule, that's what I promised. But unfortunately I had some massive equipment malfunctions that I'm going to have to now sort out. I'm actually in America travelling at the moment so I was preparing to get the Eno video done for today so you guys could watch it. Um, but that just didn't happen because of these equipment problems. So luckily I had this video recorded already. So that's what you're getting today. You're going to get another Deep Cuts Essentials. When I get back from America... I will do a discussion video and then the week after the Brian Eno guide will be coming, I promise, just, just bear with me. And I hope you enjoy the video, thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. So I'm trying to keep these Deep Cuts essentials as interesting and as varied as possible, trying to go into different genres, different artists, hopefully introduce some of you to new albums you haven't heard before. Enter my fourth Deep Cuts essential, Yank Crime by Drive Like Jehu. Drive Like Jehu were a post-hardcore band from San Diego, California. They got together in 1990. Uh, they were only together about five years, they disbanded in 95, they released two full-length records. They did get back together briefly for some reunion shows between 2014 and 2016, but nothing really came of that. An important band in that Californian post-hardcore scene, Drive Like Jay, who also kind of sat on the periphery of the emo core tag, because their music has that abrasive, fricative, stylistic trait of post-hardcore, but it also has the tangible fervour of emo. And no, I'm not talking about this kind of emo, or this kind of emo, or this kind of emo. I'm talking about that period of these creative bands making emotive music. Uh, it, mostly of it was coming out of Washington DC in the Midwest. We had the Midwestern emo scene, which is what it's known as. Bands like Rites of Spring, Cat and Jazz, Sunny Day Real Estate, The Promise Ring. These bands have that emo tag, but it's not the same sort of sound as these emo revival periods that we're getting now. I'm the, personally, I'm not a fan of these revival scenes particularly. It's not, it doesn't have much of a connection left to the original emo music, which is what I'm talking about here. Even post-hardcore is a term that has evolved so much since the 90s. I mean, in 2017, post-hardcore does not mean the same thing. It is not the same kind of music. I'm talking of the bands like Shellac, Fugazi, Refused, um, and, you know, if you now listen to some of the post-hardcore bands in 2017, I mean, if you listen to go and listen to a band like Pierce the Veil or um, A Day to Remember, ew. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that Drive Like Jehu are split, but kind of split between those genres. They're definitely a post-hardcore band. I think they have elements of emo to them. I think mainly down to their ragged approach and there's like a raw emotion to their music. Um, but yeah, it's not the sort of emo that you might be thinking of if you're not particularly familiar with the Midwest 90s emo phase. DOJ's debut record is a strong release, but for this video I just had to go for their second and final release, 1994's Yank Crime. It's a record that sounds so fresh, I feel like it could be released in 2017 and capture the hearts and minds of people all over again. It just has none of that 90s throwback feel to it. Guitarist John Rise reflected on this in a recent interview with Noisy. I think the record holds up pretty well. I think because we recorded it in the way we did and we spent so much time working on that record and thinking about it, for me, the wince quotient is really low in comparison to all the other records that I made during this time. The stellar creativity and passion displayed on this album is just wonderful. Guitarist and vocalist Rick Froberg, guitarist John Rice, bassist Mike Kennedy and drummer John Trombino made a sweaty, stifling album that intermingles rage, tension and reflection. You might notice that the name of the band refers to a passage from the Old Testament of the Bible. Don't worry if not, I'm not particularly an avid reader myself. And it feels apt that they choose a brutal Old Testament passage to lay the foundation for their music. Jehu being in the Bible, he is a, a war commander in the army of Ahab and he's chosen by God to take down Ahab and he eventually becomes the king of Israel, chosen by God himself. And the watchmen told, saying, He came even unto them, and cometh not again. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he driveth furiously. Never thought I'd be reading a Bible verse out on this channel, I have to be honest. And driveth furiously, Yank Crime does. 
right from the first note of Here Come the Rome Plows all the way through to those final incendiary seconds of sinews. The seething energy on opening track Here Come the Rome Plows just cuts right through. You have that scratchy bass riff in 10-8 before Trombino throws down with his aggressive, explosive drum style, and Rice and Froberg have these guitar lines that are sort of clashing into one another, harmony be damned. The dissonance the two of them create with their melody lines propels that fricative turbulence, and that's further maximised through Froberg's aggro vocal style, which is kind of a mix of half shout, half wail, sometimes vulnerable, but always powerful. Lyrically, this track appears to allude to the US military's destruction of the forests in Cambodia and Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and it adds a protest edge to their already sawtooth sound. Cal State, no fun, stay put man, here come, too late, yank crime, erase, yank crime. What really adds to the twisting violence of their sound are the fidgety time signatures, and it gives their music a mathy slant to it, albeit a very messy, unrefined, mathy slant. This was an early proponent of both the math rock and the post-hardcore scenes of the early 90s, and it makes it difficult to differentiate between what would be either considered math rock or post-hardcore early on. For instance, a band like Polvo, would you consider them math rock or would you consider them post-hardcore? I mean, I put them in my math rock five albums way back when I did that video, but they could also be considered post-hardcore as well. And in that way, Drive Like Jay, who could probably be considered math, certainly on some of the tracks on this album. After that intense opening track, follow-up track Do You Compute is a, it sort of reveals the true nature of the record and the construction of the record. And that is, the band are content with taking their time to allow these individual songs of menace and clout to resonate. Case in point, this track is seven minutes long, beginning with guitar and bass slowly building up a melancholy melody uh, before bursting in full in the almost two minutes into the track. Brooding is probably the word that best describes this song. It has a bubbling tension, uh, but also it, it utilizes a level of restraint that the track Here Come the Rome Plows forcefully renounces. This gives the record such a strength in its diversity. I love the change up. They have short tracks and the much longer tracks that really build to these climaxes. And it really adds to the sonic journey that the band are presenting us with. And these switch ups really succeed in this. Third track, Golden Brown, is a similarly inflammatory cut to the opening track. It feels as if the band are holding on by the skin of their teeth. They're barely keeping the thing together. I mean this in a good way. This kind of ragged performance captured in the recording process is what gives the album such an emotive quality. I wouldn't have it any other way and it wouldn't be the same album if it was recorded differently. Now we reach one of the defining pieces of the record, Luau, the longest track on the album at about nine and a half minutes. A conquering track defined by its repetitive bass riff, Trombino's thwacking drum part. It just drives on exhaustedly. It feels like the band want to stop but they're being compelled to push on by some higher power. I might be reading too much into the biblical allusions of their name, uh, but there you go. Those ascending guitar bend notes in the second part of the verse are so paranoid, they really develop this chaotic atmosphere. The insistence, the dissonance, the anger means that the simple inclusion of more harmony almost makes for a transcendental moment. About seven minutes in, the guitar chords change up and they just add a bit more of a melodic counterpoint to the track. And it, it's subtle, but it adds so much weight to the music and it gives a real sense of progression too. Final track, Sinews, which is almost as long as Luau, it builds an even more dissonant and unsure space. It's a cynical and aggressive ending to an album that's already brimming with fury and angst. More so than other tracks on this record, Sinews reminds me of, of the songwriting and performance approach of bands like Slint. So Slint's masterpiece released three years prior, Spiderland, unbelievable album. Um, it has a similar approach. It's things like willing to drag out sections of a piece of music to add dramatic effect. And it's an uncompromising way to write these songs because it's eschewing that typical structuring of a track which frees them creatively. It allows them to make unusual, compelling music. Although stylistically quite different, the way DLJ build up sinews to that smashing conclusion really reminds me of the conclusion to Spiderland, which is the track Good Morning Captain, which is another unbelievable ending to an album. And I don't want to start talking about Spiderland now, but I can just see some comparisons there. So if you are familiar with Spiderland, I'd be interested to see what you think of the, of the ending of uh, this record, Yank Crime, and you see if you can see like a comparison there. It should also be noted that the 2003 reissue of Yank Crime includes a couple more tracks. You've got the track Hand Over Fist, 
bullet train to Vegas, and then there's also an alternative version of Sinews as well. So if you're confused as to why I'm talking about not talking about those tracks, and I talked about Sinews as the final track, that's that's why. The angst and cynicism is so vigorously harnessed and expressed throughout this entire album. It grabs hold of you and it just doesn't let go. And that's the reason this record is so brilliant. And it's also the reason why it is a deep cuts essential. Thanks for watching. Let me know what your thoughts are on Yank Crime in the comments section below. Uh, make sure you recommend Deep Cuts to a friend because we're slowly growing this wonderful little community. It's growing by day and getting better and better. So uh, make sure you spread the word of Deep Cuts if you so wish. Uh, thank you for all the support and I'll see you next week.